I'm Marilyn, CEO and founder of Cosmic Centers and the host of our weekly live video series, Center Stage. We are in the middle of our second season, all about the magic of teams and what makes teams cohesive, high performing and happy. We are now in the third chapter of the season, all about coaching teams. And we started off learning how to coach teams together, how psychological safety can be brought into the conversation. And now we're going to be talking about the role of purpose and culture in enabling the right environments for organizations and teams. As a reminder, every Thursday, I'm joined by experts and thought leaders on LinkedIn Live at 3.30 p.m. UAE time, that's right now, to share insights, experiences, and perspectives. And you can always tune in and find us here every week. Before we begin, as always, do show us some love, give us a like, share this video with someone who you think might enjoy it, and please be generous with your comments and your questions. I always make sure that we get through those questions together and make time for Lucy to answer them. Uh, let me introduce our guest for today, Lucy Dabo. She's been living in the Middle East for over 40 years, providing professional consulting services to clients and businesses across the Middle East, Africa, and Europe since 1998. Uh, and her work is uniquely placed in the region. She's proud to deliver firsthand the infinite power of a positive culture on both business performance and employee engagement to make great culture the norm, not the exception within workplaces around the world. That's so close to our heart, I can't even begin to say. Her first business, Dabo & Co., which she co-founded with her sister Camilla, was the leading independent communications agency in the Middle East, subsequently acquired by the world's largest PR agency, Edelman, showing that culture is a business superpower. In 2021, Lucy launched Together, a dedicated workplace culture consultancy focusing on three areas, people, purpose, and culture. She's been recognized as Entrepreneur of the Year by the SME Stars of Business Awards and named as one of the 50 most influential Brits in the Arabian Business Index. Her company, Dabo & Co., was also listed in the top 10 great places to work two years consecutively, ranked in the Dubai SME 100, and received over 30 industry awards for the quality and creativity of the work. She's also committed to supporting women in business, is a board member of Global Women in PR, Mina, and an executive coach. She's an experienced public speaker on topics including brand, culture, purpose, entrepreneurship, and female empowerment, and has been featured in several podcasts, including Business is Personal with Dr. Corey Block and The Drive to Succeed. Lucy, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Marilyn. It's great to be here. I'm really excited about what we're going to be covering. And, you know, we all have heard the infamous uh, Peter Drucker quote, culture mm -hmm. eat strategy for breakfast. Um, and for many, culture and purpose can seem like abstract concept, but, you know, we both believe in how real their effects are. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of research and studies to show the benefit of having a strong and cohesive company culture and an organization that is aligned with its purpose. Um, this allows you know, employees to have a bar for what is expected. It attracts talents. We know also well the importance of purpose for millennials, um, and it increases employee engagement. So Lucy, you're going to talk to us a little bit about how your company is, together is helping organizations on people, purpose, and culture. Uh, and then you know, we'll also cover uh, how you implement this together with the companies you work with and, and how the people who are listening in today um, can start a conversation around culture, purpose, and people in their own organizations. Are you ready to go? I'm ready. Thank you. And what an amazing introduction, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, very much appreciated. So together, and the name obviously is not a coincidence, um, is a dedicated workplace culture consultancy. So we're very niche and very specifically about workplace culture. And we focus on three areas, people, purpose, and culture. Because from our perspective, those are the three core areas that all contribute to whether your culture is effective and will become a superpower or ineffective and, be, and you'll have less performance, obviously. So when we look at people, it's really about internal communications, capability building, coaching. How do we put people at the core and be a people-centric organization? Um, with the purpose piece, which obviously you and I share a huge passion around in the greater context with culture as well, it's really what is the reason the business exists? Do the people within the organization understand 
what the company actually does. Because if, you know, large and small organizations, you often find that the leadership team have complete clarity. And there's this enormous void when you then speak to anyone who might be middle management or below. And that's such a shame because these individuals have no idea how they're contributing to the organization because they're not even sure what the organization really does or what it stands for. And then when we look at culture, it's really then about culture transformation or evolution, depending on the context. And there's often a kind of assumption that we rescue toxic cultures. And I think it's important to say, yes, of course, we can and we do. But primarily, the kind of clients that we're working with are already in good, at, but they want to be great. They want to be better because everyone can always improve. Brilliant. And so today you and I are actually going to cover all three of these chapters and I've prepared a bunch of questions for you and I'm sure the audience is going to chime in. I see Mimi here saying it's wonderful to see you live on LinkedIn and talking about something so critical. So we already have our fans lined up. Uh, let's dig in a little bit. So, you know, on this on this topic of uh, purpose, you mentioned that great disconnect, right, we, we, between leadership and middle management. Uh, a story that I that I often share with um, leaders or anybody I'm speaking to about purpose is an anecdote that is not verified, but uh, I don't know, you might be familiar with it, um, from uh, JFK, who supposedly went to NASA one day uh, and was saw a janitor there, it seemed like a great press op, uh, goes up to speak to him, asks him what he does there, and the janitor says, I'm putting a man on the moon. And I think that's the that's what you're pointing to, which is, it's so important for everybody to know what the purpose is in order to be able to contribute to it. Um, and one of the other things that normally, you know, we can consider when we look at purpose is that a lot of companies are um, used to things like mission and value, you know, vi vision statements, things like that. The purpose sits even closer to the core of why a company exists. Um, so talk to us a little bit about your thoughts around the importance of that purpose statement, how long it should be valid for, is it a forever? thing just give me your thoughts around that um first of all i have to say by the way that's my favorite quote of all time so it's amazing that you opened with that because had you not shared it i would have done so we're coming from the same place i always think it's helpful to kind of simplify the purpose vision mission values because one thing we often hear is a little bit of misunderstanding about what's what and why did what makes them different so from our point of view we'd be like vision is the picture Mission is sort of the path to get you there. And values are the behaviors that support the journey. Purpose is the reason you're doing it. And that ultimately is so that everyone from the janitor to the CEO knows exactly why they're there and what they're contributing towards. And in that context, hopefully it makes a lot more sense why purpose becomes so important because we all strive to be contributing in one way or another to society, to the world, to our own values. And a purpose is really something that you can get behind in simplest, simplest terms. Um, they can change, but often what we find is that the vision, mission and values change, but your purpose will often, the core of it will remain. You know, it might evolve a little bit. If we think of someone like um, Nike, for example, you know, that today it's breaking barriers which is all around pushing and striving in that athleticism and you know, celebrating all that is athletics um, and associations to that. They've been close to that for decades, right? But it's just slightly tweaked. What tends to change more is the values and how those contribute. And you might have seen um, Meta, Mark Zuckerberg just announced all their new values. And it's interesting, he only announced new values, not a new purpose, not a new vision just um, a very different way of approaching how they show up for work every day. Um, anyway, that's probably a separate topic, whether or not he's done a good job with that or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will look at values in a minute. I think, yeah, I, I definitely echo what you're saying around purpose um, in the sense that it generally, I think it tends to be something that doesn't change much. You might change the words that you use to express it, maybe make them more contemporary, especially if you're like a long lived company. You just might want to refresh the words around them, but the fundamental reason why you exist uh, shouldn't change. And I think both you and I are like, uh, you know, you're a second time entrepreneur. I'm a young entrepreneur for the first time in a, in a company that's now a bit more than uh, a year old. Um, when I started my company, I, I tried to follow my own advice. And so I said, 
don't start with your product, start with your purpose, right? What do you want to do? Because then as an entrepreneur, for example, having just my purpose as a starting point allowed me to iterate on what I was going to sell, right? Because it matters a bit less what my product is. What has been your experience of um, finding the purpose for together? Well, yeah, we have to be the best advert for culture and values and purpose. So it was definitely a really important part of the journey. And in its simplest terms, and it, you know, purpose can often sound very un unattainable. And I think that's really important because we have to believe in a better future. We have to believe in more um, as humans. Otherwise, it would be so challenging to just accept the status quo of what today is. And certainly, I think what we've all been through in the last two years, more than ever, looking to the future and to a brighter, better opportunity and how we can contribute that has never been more important or more impactful for us. So for us, it's about changing lives by making great culture the norm, not the exception. And that is that is what we live by every day. And we were, you and I were talking about that just before we started, about how we can help contribute to the industry to people, to businesses outside of just our paying customers, because the purpose is much greater than the revenue. The revenue is important, you know, we are commercial entities, but in the end, it allows us as um, individuals and as teammates to contribute to a much bigger, more important um, purpose that contributes to the revenue as well. But ultimately, everyone who joins our team feels the same. They all want to contribute to making great culture the norm. And that gives us a complete unity and an alignment that's really important for us to be able to meet our objectives as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really such a beautiful point. Purpose goes way beyond revenue, but it'll bring revenue. You know, if you yeah. believe in your purpose enough and you work towards it, you know, abundance will come. That's what, you know, what I like to say as well. It'll come, it'll come in the form of money or it'll come in the form of being able to support others, but it'll come and that's really what matters. And it allows you to iterate on how you serve others. Um, and then we always talk about, you know, you mentioned this, uh, how mission, vision and values kind of come to support the purpose mm -hmm. and maybe put a little bit of meat on the bones, so to speak. Um, talk to me about how values help to align with the company purpose. I mean, they are so important. It's essentially, you know, values are the behaviors that we bring to what we do every day. And when you look at that in the context of a team dynamic, it's so important that we have a kind of our own language that we speak because we're a community, you know, a working group are a community. And the more we consider hybrid working and remote working, being really clear about what connects us and how we all show up to contribute is so important because in this region particularly where we have such a high proportion of expatriates you know and i've been here all my life and i've worked with you know all types of different nationalities and every single you know we use english as the primary language in the uae particularly and if we use a word for a value you know we say go you know do i trust you you could have 15 different interpretations of what trust means, dependent on the legacy, dependent on where you've come from in the world, dependent on the family values that brought you up. So where values become really important, it's about being really explicit. You know, it's about saying trust is a value, but this is what trust means in this organization. This is what it means for us. And this is how you demonstrate that. And you can show up in a way that the business is expecting you to show up and that you are absolutely contributing to it which also then allows the business to recognize and reward in a very fair way that everyone is aligned with. And then that moves into hiring and firing, to be honest. If you're very explicit about the behaviors and the principles and expectations of your workforce, it makes it really clear whether someone fits or someone doesn't. And you know that comes into then people management and how managers deal with conflict. When you have a really clear set of values, it's prescriptive for you. It's like, okay, our values say we should do this and this person isn't doing that. So I don't have to have the awkward conversation. It's like, that's not what we do around here. Please, can you align with it? Or maybe it's not for you and then that makes a very easy decision. Yeah, absolutely. We have a great question from the audience about values here. You know, we tend to, when we read values, they're always, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call them valorous, right? Like 
we have a tendency to believe that values have to make us look like good people. Um, mm -hmm. but you could have as one of your values money, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't make you a bad person. Um, so a question here from Kareem is, do you think there are good and bad values or does it not matter as long as they're carrying the purpose? It's a great question. I actually don't think that you can have bad values if they have been created in an inclusive way, because one big challenge with values is if leadership create them in a room and then launch them and haven't included anyone from the organization, because then it's a mandate and, you know, values are part of a culture movement. So they need to be created inclusively. Um, it's a really good point about whether it's perception, right? We do, we use the Barrett Values um, culture assessment tool a lot of the time when we go into organizations and we have different tools depending on the needs, but it's one of the ones that we use quite frequently because it's very simple and it's very effective. And in that, it will assess very quickly across your organization what positive values and what are what they would call limiting belief values. Now, the interesting thing here is that's a generic assessment tool. So it's not able to take into consideration the type of organization you are. So one value might be command. So that command and control, you know, which is I say you do. Now, if you're in Apple, that would be the worst type of value because they stand for innovation. Now, you can't innovate and have master slave mentality because the two don't work. However, if we were in the armed forces, in the military, Command is a life-saving, you know, value and management style. So it's incredibly important that the values make the right sense in the context of what the organization does, what the organization prioritizes, and what will contribute to ultimately the business thriving. And that's why if they're done in the right way, they're inclusive, they're authentic, they're aligned to the business strategy, then it would be hard to believe they could ever be wrong, honestly. Yeah, I think that's such an important point. It's all contextual. There is no universal approach to these things. I remember once seeing a study um, that looked at the shared words, you know, like how many shared values do companies have? And we often find these like very, um, you know, expected things like integrity yeah. or honesty. Uh, and I think sometimes I wonder whether it's worth it to write down integrity in your <laughs> values Maybe we should all have integrity. That should be like a universal one uh, and try to focus on what makes us kind of um, unique in terms of what we value as an organization. Um, well, it's what does integrity mean for you? Because integrity is, again, it, these, these are very generic words, aren't they? It's interpreting what they mean for your organization and for your workforce and for your team. And that will be very specific to you. How about, be. what are your thoughts on aspirational values? So sometimes you'll you'll talk to a team or, or members in an organization, and let's say the company has five or six values, and you realize that actually two or three of them are actually really lived out, uh, meaning they're, they're ingrained in the way they behave, as you were mentioning earlier, their performance management, how they run a meeting, how they make decisions. And yet there might be one or two that are aspirational. We're not there yet. We would like to behave this way, but it's not happening. What are your thoughts around that? I mean, it's always really good to push and strive for excellence. You know, again, depending on what you do, will do, I think it's not fair for it to be something that will never be attained because then it sort of isn't authentic and it's not real. And therefore it becomes, you know, you run the risk of it being words on a wall. And it's like, oh, that's the one we can never do. So we just don't include that one. We focus on the other ones that we can do. They should be some, you know, they should stretch you in a way that explains what's expected of you. So if it's always, you know, always better, for example, what does that mean? It means that we cross check, we cross reference, you know, we're always doing that bit extra to do better than we did before because it matters. Then that's something that's obviously probably not happening today and will never be met, but we're always pushing for it. It's really important that they resonate and it's simple to understand and it's something, because it's behavior based, it should be actionable. If it becomes more philosophical, then potentially it needs to be more in the vision category and maybe it's not a value after all. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We have a question here from May, um, a little bit about how kind of 
personal and professional values can sometimes not be aligned. She mentions that particularly in the Gulf, um, there are a lot of toxic work cultures because they're very much focused on high performance and like survival of the fittest kind of uh, space. Um, and sometimes they clash against one's personal values. Um, what are your thoughts around how to how to make sure as an employee, you know, you mentioned earlier, like, listen, if our values aren't for you, then maybe we part ways simply because that's okay. We don't have to be pleasing everybody. Um, but your thoughts on like, when does that become toxic versus when is it just a difference of opinion? It's probably the biggest challenge, you know, globally and locally, honestly, because you've all heard about the great resignation and so many, you know, 40% of the workforce are looking for jobs. And we did a UAE survey on culture um, a couple of months ago, and it is interesting. I mean, only 1% of the people we surveyed didn't think, uh, thought, didn't think culture was important. I mean, that's extraordinary, one in 100 people, and, and who knows who that one person was, or two people, whoever. Um, the reality is that we have to find a middle ground. You know, I, either you have a choice and you can look to move if the clash is too great, which honestly, we are in, uh, you know, an emerging market. Recruitment is skyrocketing at the moment. So if there is ever a time to look, now is a good time, honestly. Because if you get to the point where it's so compromising on your personal values, then, and you're not feeling that you can speak to your manager, you can bring any of your real self to work when you spend more than a third of your life doing, you know, at the office or at home, working from home in the context of hybrid working today. It's a really difficult one. But what I do know is that certainly going through what we've gone through in the last two years, so many of these scary unknowns that stopped so many people taking the leap have now been faced. You know, we know what it's like to have to deal with really, really stressful working environments, you know, with the world changing underneath us without any of our control. And that's helped a lot of people realize that you can do what you want to do. There is opportunity that, you know, it's not necessarily as frightening as it may have seemed. And that is a huge contributor to why so many people are looking to leave their jobs. So I think it's a very personal thing, honestly, for you, May. And I'm sorry if that hasn't entirely answered the question. But what I can tell you is that as long as you don't feel that you're literally compromising, you know, your own integrity and your own ethics, then it's you have to make the call whether it's worth it or not, I'm afraid. Makes sense. I have one last question about values from Rhea, and then Dedef made a really amazing point that will move us on to our next uh, you know, theme for today. But just one last question here. Um, can having values and principles that are too explicit, constantly repeating within a company, be limiting to innovation or introducing new ways of thinking? Or are values always the guidelines through which we hire more like-minded people into an organization? So when, how much is too much, so to speak? I mean, I think you're right, they can be used in the wrong way. It's like anything, you know, it's a bit like exercise or eating, you know, you can totally follow a path and get it totally wrong. You know, you can exercise too much, you can eat too much without, you know, because you've been told orange juice is the best thing and it gives you vitamin C and then you drink orange juice all day every day. And then before you know it, your sugar levels are through the roof. And I think that's the same when it comes to values. It's about the construct of the whole communication ecosystem within an organization. If the values are just being drummed home every day by leadership as a kind of repetitive, non-actioned point, then of course it will just become white noise. It's about integrating the values into every aspect of the organization through how are we talking about it from an internal communications point of view. So are we you know, recognizing and rewarding people about it? Are we sharing stories about our teammates who are living and demonstrating what that value looks like when they are at work and doing their job? Are we looking at it in consideration to the bigger business objectives? Do we know what the objectives are or do they keep talking about values and we're like, I don't know how that helps contribute to it. And that's really why there is, it's, it's a challenge because it's a big investment for an organization to commit to improving their culture it takes big investment. And that's not just financial, it's time, it's commitment, 
it's consistency. You know, you don't just get to say it and then go, right, we've done that. Move on to the next challenge. And I think that's what is surprising a lot of organizations. The good news is, honestly, and I know, you know, we are further behind regionally because things come to us slightly later. Employers are going to have to change. In the long run, they are not going to have a choice. You know, right now it's the progressive leaders that we're working with, but in the not too far distant future, um, it will not be optional anymore. And I think you were talking about millennials earlier. I mean, I, I read a staggering figure in 2025, 2025, which is only three and a half years away or something, 75% of the workforce will be millennial. So when you think about that, employees will start acting with their feet and then yeah. the only option is to really take sharp look at how you operate for your people and your culture. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and definitely the pandemic has uh, has given all of us a reason to think about what we want to wake up to every day, millennial or not, and driven the point home that we want to spend our time on things that matters and with people who matter. And so um, it has helped uh, kind of land that message too as a positive side effect. Now, Dedev says, sometimes using generic language, poetry, what people may perceive as poetry in the way we express, whether it be it a purpose, a value, uh, makes others disregard all of this. Um, and that, like you, he believes that everything needs to be specific to the business and the business goals. Um, you've spoken to us a little bit about how you can make this very tangible. Maybe tell us a story or give us one example of one way in which you you help companies or you've seen companies implement the values in ways that make them less esoteric so to speak um well a recent um client we worked with i think it's always valuable because we we always recognize i use nike as an example and the problem is everyone's always going oh well they're a brand they're retail how does that affect you know the normal us average um you know businesses that are just doing the same stuff and not front and center in the media. So we were working with a port management company. So couldn't be further from Nike, you know, very high percentage of blue collar workers, terminal workers across four countries, um, you know, US, Saudi, UAE. So quite a, a mixed um, demographic as well. And for them, one of the really important things we did, so we, the most important, I think I mentioned, is inclusive. We spoke to the organization, to the people in the organization, because ultimately there is, you need the C-suite buy-in because nothing happens without the board and unfortunately the C-suite um, getting you started. But ultimately, for real change to happen, it takes the entire organization. So we spoke to the entire organization, did our process to measure the culture. We did interactive workshops to really get to the core of what values mattered in that organization and would help them get closer to where they needed to be and unite their team. But the reality was we were talking across so many different languages. We were talking about so many different time zones. How did we make it really tangible and unified? And so it was more about creative tactics, really. That's when it becomes really about communications. Rather than just values, we built a kind of iconography concept so that each value had a symbol and an icon that matched it, which meant that you didn't have to write it. You just needed to see it. Now, obviously, it took time, you know, like any campaign, seven times to land a message. So there was a lot around how we use the branding within the various workspaces and at the terminals, how we could communicate all the different tiers in the business. But the longer term goal was, that when people were behaving in a certain way and recognizing it, that way you could just give them a pin with the symbol because that was very clear to understand for everyone and became much easier. It became like a, an emoji you can put on your signature. Um, we had different you know, teams backdrops so that managers could have themes for their team meetings. So it was a lot of tactical ways. It's kind of how do you move the strategy and the thinking into really simple, effective communication tools that mean they're embedded and they really land with people rather than conceptual picture on a wall that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with that. And I think, you know, both you and I come from like, a, you know, PR or marketing or brand background. And one of the things that I always raise is that we do we do a lot of work for our customers, right? To chew the message for them, to repeat it, to provide it in different ways. Um, 
to be relentless about communicating about our brand to the outside world. And yet we don't afford the same level of care for how we communicate it internally. And so I really just want to kind of raise that from what you said, which is think of it as a marketing campaign. What would you have done? You know, and a lot of times we think, oh, we'll just publish the values and put them somewhere. And that's that. But would you do that with your customer? You would never do that with your customers. So why don't you just, you know, take all these learnings, get your marketing team to come in and do this as if it was a full campaign. And I guarantee that it'll have a very different result. And uh, some of the ideas that you shared probably definitely come from your, your experience in that space as well. Um, you also mentioned a little bit about how you measure culture. Um, what are some of the tools that you use or what are, what do you look at? How do you, what are the measurements that you make when you're looking at how culture or values are being um, implemented? That's one of the, the biggest challenges and the greatest, I suppose, excitement about this type of work because there is no one perfect tool because it's an emerging sort of proposition, if you like. Um, and that was the biggest challenge we faced very early on was how do we measure it? Because there isn't one perfect tool. We use different tools for different parts. So our methodology and, and my strong belief around what culture, how you can culture uh, measure culture, sorry, is called the PrEP model. And that's looking at four different areas. Firstly, purpose. We touched on that. What is happening in the organization? How well do people understand what on earth is going on? What does the business do? What does it stand for? All of that. Secondly, reputation. That's the biggest change in brand culture. We can call it that because it's similar to what you were saying in the last sort of five years. Businesses can't afford to miss a step now because it will be front page news, certainly for the bigger brands, but it's becoming more accountable for everyone. So what is not only the public saying about your organization, but what is your reputation internally? And you just touched on it, customers. They're such an important part of that. What they see you as or how they see you behave is incredibly valuable insight. So we're looking then at purpose, reputation, engagement is really important because when we measure culture, we're measuring the we and engagement's measuring the I. So engagement's an important factor, but it's not the only one. And a lot of organizations make that mistake. Um, so those is really important. And then the final piece is obviously um, around purpose, sorry, performance. Um, how is the business performing? How do teams communicate with each other? When we set targets, do we reach them? How effectively do we reach them? How's our attention, our attrition, all of these different aspects. And we look across those four areas. So we use different tools for each of them. Sadly, there isn't one that exists. And that's our big goal to have um, a piece of IP that will do that for us within the next two years. But at the moment, we use different ones. And look, if you're a small organization with less budget, there's some really cool tools out there. Um, things like Culture Amp, you're probably familiar with that one, Marilyn. Um, Pecan, I mean, there's really popular, there are a lot of different formats and platforms that will enable you that you may not get such comprehensive feedback, but at least you'll get a pulse check. And I think if you don't know what's happening, then it's absolutely impossible for you to make any kind of plan or affect any kind of change because you're literally guessing. And that's is proven to be very ineffective. <laughs> yes, any piece of data is better than no data at all. And I agree, just because it's hard doesn't mean you shouldn't try and look at it, even if it's partial, even if it's difficult to connect concepts. Um, another one I'll add to the list for those who are listening um, is one that I use for my team because we're a small team. And, you know, We probably don't need much more than that at this point um, is one called Office Vibe. Um, I think there's so many different ones. Leapsum is another, like there's plenty. Um, and I think even just your employees seeing that you collect data, you look at it, you have a conversation about it. You see how you can improve the ones that are not doing well. You see how you can maintain the ones where you score, scored high. I think even just that is demonstrating that you're taking this very seriously. Uh, and I love your point also about performance. A lot of times um, this stuff gets like put into the mushy category and the truth is that culture drives performance. There is data over data over data to show that. Um, and, you know, it's incredible that we even still have to have a debate between performance and engagement or performance and culture. They are. And of course, you can have performance with a shitty culture. Like, that's, that's not to thing. say, you know. <laughs> when you look at the matrix, you can score really highly in performance. Like, yeah. we, we will have clients that are, you know, at the top of their game performance-wise, but their engagement zero. So therefore their culture is impacted by that. 
because it's only so long you can drive that performance before the performance will start to falter because the engagement will impact it. And look, I mean, I, I built a business based on culture that went on to demonstrate that it could be valued enormously. And it was not an intentional drive at the start. Mm -hmm. It was very intuitive. But culture was at the core and we had a culture manager. We invested in it. We had dedicated resource. And this is going back 10 years because it was the absolute heartbeat of what made our organization great. And that's why I'm so fanatical because I've seen firsthand what culture at the core will demonstrate from a commercial point of view. It's extraordinary. And that was never our intention, but that was an incredible outcome and a very happy consequence of deeply caring about culture and your people. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of people, a couple of questions for you there. Um, you know, in, in the uh, report that you mentioned that you guys published this year, it's, it's on your homepage. Um, maybe uh, someone on my team can also put a link to it. Thank um, you. you mentioned that what matters is that um, when it comes to culture, connecting is more important than directing. And we kind of touched on this about inclusivity and, and how you can bring everybody into the process. Um, but what is the right balance of like top down directed culture versus bottom up or employee led directed culture? Um, it, it often is the case, actually, that when new leaders come in, you, you always see like, oh, we're going to write new values. And it's like, well, you just came in. You have like there are people who've been here for 10 years. Like, let, let's talk about how you suddenly decide that there is a bunch of new values we need to follow. Oftentimes, values is used as a tool for um, change management, but not always plugged in at the right moment. Uh, just talk to me about that balance between how, you know, leaders recognizing that culture is an important thing and they want to drive it, but also creating enough space for employees to feel like they're also in the driver's seat. No, 100%. I mean, I'm, I think I touched on it earlier. It's so important to have leadership buy-in because if they're not committed, then it will 100% fail because it requires the prioritization at a leadership level and even at a board level. Like for me, the ambition is chief culture officer and a seat on the board because they, you know, these are influences on what happens within an organization. And if they're not on board and they are not prioritizing it as an agenda point, it will get forgotten about. And that is the harsh reality. So our work, I know that my client is the C-suite and board, but I do the work for the people, 100%. You know, culture is about impacting every individual in an organization. But, you know, we need to have the investment and the prioritization. So leaders have to be behind it. And more importantly, they really need to believe in the output. Because if they don't model the behaviors that they have set out for the rest of the organizations, it will never succeed yeah, because it's just contradiction in terms. And there's nothing worse than seeing that. I think we've probably Actually, all seen it. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I'm going off script here, but, uh, you know, you raised the point that for me is always very interesting. Some companies tend to think that culture and values is an HR problem. And I love what you just said. It's not. It's a business problem. It needs to be led by the CEO or uh, someone really high up there on the C-suite. And it also needs to be for larger companies of interest to the board. Um, how do you make sure you don't get relegated into like, oh, that's an HR problem? I don't, we don't work with those clients, honestly. I mean, I'm, look, HR is such an important role. And the way we would see it is that every, you know, you should, firstly, it's everyone's problem. Culture is not the CEO's problem. It's not HR's problem. Every single person in the organization has a role to play. And scenarios where you have a group of people saying, it's not my problem, HR are doing a rubbish job. Look, if we don't all contribute, if we don't all work towards the same goal, like with anything, it's really hard. And you'll look, you'll have cynics. It happens. But we need, like I said, it's a movement. You need the majority to be moving in the right direction. Where it can become slightly more difficult is when, you know, management just take over and the movement has begun and management changes. And those are things that are out of our control, ultimately. And it does happen. You know, we've seen it firsthand. But if, if a CEO isn't willing to stand behind the project, then 100% we wouldn't start it because it won't, it won't work. And we're not in the business of doing culture evolutions or transformations for organizations where they're going to fail because it's no, no point. Um, but it must be inclusive. The CEO has to be behind it. They have to invest the time. They have to be committed. And therefore, it has the best chance possible of succeeding. Without that, sadly not. 
couldn't agree more. Big appeal to make sure that everybody understands that this is an yeah. everybody problem. And like you, if the if if I'm not talking to someone who who can, you know, put support and put their weight behind it, then I'll say, listen, call me back when you guys are ready. You're you're probably not ready right now. And um, you know, as you said earlier, this will become not optional. And hopefully in the next few years. So an appeal to everybody to start this conversation inside their organizations uh, and to make sure that high and low, everybody's behind uh, the need for something like this. And, uh, and it's incredible to see um, this, this conversation being driven at that level. So mm-hmm. super grateful to have you in this community as well and echoing that message. It's, it's such an important piece. Um, and with that, Lucy, we're coming to, I don't know if you, if you, I didn't feel the time pass. I was like, really? It's already been 40 minutes. What are we talking about? Um, it's been so great speaking to you, but um, I have to land us on our rapid uh, fire questions. So um, if you're ready, um, I can start with the first one. Yeah, ready. Let's go. Let's go. All right. So what is the one thing that every team needs? Clarity. Yes. Good one. What's the one thing a team needs to avoid at all costs? Duplication. There's nothing more <laughs> than everyone doing the same job because no one talks to each other and oh, that's so true. energy waste of time. Yes, yeah, in, big, in big organizations, it's probably one of the most frustrating things ever. Yeah. Um, what is a good team leader? I think there's three things. Mm-hmm. Curious. You have to be interested in everything and every aspect of the organization. Um, care, it's so underrated as a leadership skill. Empathy, care, you know, we're humans. That is the most important message. You have to care about humans for them to care about you. So it's really important. And thirdly, be available. Hmm. Um, so often, and I think in this region particularly, where we have some slightly, you know, more old fashioned constructs around office environment, you know, these big, scary offices with huge doors. And people to get through to get to um, you know their manager, you really should be available because that's essential to getting anything done. Yeah, absolutely. What's the best book on teams? I mean, I I love this book. This is the problem, but it's like from two thousand and one. So I'm either showing my age or it's just. <laughs> um, Jim Collins, good to great. And I yeah, I know you're not showing. I mean, that's an incredible book. It's not about age. There are books. And that he just- used culture. He was on that culture piece long before. And people get the right people, right people every time. I think I have it. Yeah, right there. It's on my bookshelf. So <laughs> couldn't agree more. Um, and then last but not least, what's your favorite team ritual? Well, I mean, excuse the pun on the company name, but getting people together. Whether it's virtually in person, like there is nothing more important to a team dynamic than connection. And the way to build connection is to continually connect. If you stay, you know, if you're not talking to each other, if you're not doing things together, um, it's very hard to build cohesive a nature. It really is. It's, it's, again, it's that human science, it's behavioral science is at the core of that. And it shows you care. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, I love your answers. Thank you so much for that. And um, I guess that brings us to the end of our episode. Thank you so much for joining us and for all the insights that you've shared. Oh, it's such a great pleasure. Thank you so much. And so nice to finally meet you, Marilyn. I hope we get to do things more together in the future. Likewise. Before we wrap up, I just want to thank our attendees, as always, for tuning in and their great questions. Uh, The video is available on LinkedIn forever. We'll also be reposting it on our YouTube and our website if you guys want to share it with anyone who you think might find value in everything we discussed today. You can also um, go to our website, cosmiccenters.com, and just sign up, subscribe to our newsletter, make sure you don't miss uh, our next session uh, and any of the content that we provide. Um, The team works really hard every week to put out great content, so it'll make them happy and put a smile on their face if we see um, somebody join us. Uh, And then one last thing, of course, mark your calendars for next week, uh, Thursday, February 24th, same time. We'll be talking to Dr. Vinika Rao, who's an executive director of the INSEAD Gender Initiative and Emerging Markets Institute to discuss the specific topic of female leadership. And I was gonna say in the beginning of the session, it was so wonderful 
to be in the same room as you and to have a peer, you know, and so beautiful to see a lot of the companies actually that do things similar to what, you know, we do um, at Together in Cosmic Centers are often led by women around the world. When I started researching for my company, I could see it was often female CEOs and it's just such a beautiful thing to see us leading this movement. And we'll talk to Vinika next week about is female leadership different? And if so, how? We hope to see all of you there uh, signing us off and see you next week.